nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. I'll just begin talking about the interface charges and then uh, pick up the real meat of the discussion in the, in the next class. Now one thing uh, we, we realize that this uh, interface between silicon and silicon dioxide, that region is a very complicated region. You know, silicon part you understand. Diamond lattice, do you remember from long back, diamond lattice, one for the body along the body diagonal and everything. Silicon is beautiful. Every electron where they're supposed, or every atom where they're supposed to be, very nice. But uh, as soon as you go to the oxide, first of all, oxide is amorphous, meaning they are in random places. So that's what I have shown here, that the silicon and oxygen, they are sort of randomly configured. And then there are also dangling bonds like silicon hydrogen, and I'll explain in a second why they come. I've shown on the top uh, how a silicon oxygen bond, silicon dioxide actually looks like. So the little tetrahedra with four red circles, just focus on one element. With four circles around, these rates are oxygen. And the little balls inside, inside which is a, uh, let's say, a whitish color, uh, that, that one is silicon. Silicon binds with, silicon binds with four oxygen, right? So it binds with four red atoms, do you see? And every red atom, every oxygen is sort of bound by between two silicons. Every red, look at every red. Every red has two silicon atoms, the white atoms sort of connecting it up. Therefore, you have silicon dioxide because every silicon connects to four, but every oxygen is shared between two. So as a result, effectively, every silicon has four halves, right, four halves. And that gives you silicon dioxide. So this is the amorphous structure of silicon dioxide, this random networks of tetrahedra. This is not diamond lattice. Diamond lattice doesn't look like this. This is a tetrahedra, but it looks like very different from diamond lattice, right? So that's silicon dioxide. So anytime a oxygen is missing, that's the trap. That's where all those charges were being trapped before, you know, what I was showing you before. And each of the tetrahedra, that's what I wanted to make. The oxygen is a red, and that's being shared between two silicon. That's the uh, ash-colored uh, ash uh, uh, atoms. So you can see why this is called a silicon dioxide. Many times, again, you will put it on a flat surface because it's difficult to draw in two dimension and draw correspondingly. And I have shown you before, right, how the tetrahedra, you pull out one tetrahedra out, and lay it flat, and this has the four covalent bonds. I have shown you before. But you realize that the atoms on the surface are unsatisfied because everybody has sort of four nearest neighbors. Atoms on the surface, how many did they have? They have sort of three. And one of them is sort of dangling. And that's not a good thing. Anytime, say, a bond is unattended, that can cause trouble. And what happens, do you remember that we calculated how many atoms do I have on a surface, one, zero, zero surface, one, one, one surface, do you remember? And because those bonds are dangling, those bonds can capture electrons. So those will all come as surface states. Do you remember the surface state, surface recombination velocity and all? So this is those from exactly from that diagram. So you will have a series of surface states because the crystal is no longer periodic. You're stopping it. As a result, you will have a series of dangling bonds, which are not the solution of the periodic uh, Schrodinger equation. How many do I have such dangling bonds? Okay, I'll, you have done this in a homework. How many? How many could it be? Number of atoms, silicon atoms is on the order of 10 to the power 22, 23, right? Per centimeter cube. So if you just make an estimate, number per centimeter squared on one zero zero surface would be 
on the order of 10 to the power 14 per centimeter squared per centimeter squared and if you didn't do anything that is the defect number of defects you would have had uh, that's the blue line that's the blue line number of defects you would have had 10 to the power 14 per centimeter squared that's huge number of defects no hope that a freely exposed silicon will carry any current through its surface no hope Every, every one of them will be caught by, caught by those dangling bonds because it wants another electron. Wherever it gets it, if it's going from source to drain, it will catch it and keep it for itself. So this is going to be a horrible situation. So when you put the silicon dioxide, remember that silicon, the tetra tetrahedra I just showed you, silicon shared between four oxygen and the oxygen being shared between two silicon. Remember the pre previous picture? So that has been laid flat, laid flat on the page. And that's how it looks. So as soon as you bring oxygen, a bunch of those dangling bonds are satisfied because they take care of it. But the silicon dioxide has a different lattice constant than silicon. Therefore, not all of them are satisfied. You can see that the oxygen has taken care of some silicon, but a fraction of them are still dangling. And therefore, when you oxidize, it reduces the density to 10 to the power 12, right? Because many of them have been taken care of the oxygen, but still 10 to the power 12, one would be dead with 10 to the power 12 number of centimeters squared of interface traps. So then that is the story of 1960s, that they then spend a huge amount of time to pull this, push this interface defect density down to 10 to the power 10 nowadays. Now, what is generally done in this case that if you have a lot of um, dangling bonds on the surface, silicon surface, then of course the first thing one would do is to bring down the silicon dioxide and this is the flattened version of the silicon dioxide where you see the silicon being sort of nestled between four, four atoms, oxygen atoms and every oxygen being shared by two silicon and that gives you the formula silicon dioxide because silicon half of the four each one gets and that's why it's silicon dioxide. Now of course what it does is that what you can do then is do this anneal. It's called a forming gas anneal. Forming gas anneal means that once you have grown the silicon dioxide after that you put it in a chamber where you bring in some form of hydrogen atom, some form. So there are various ways. You can bring in silane on various compounds you can bring in. But the bottom line is you bring in that hydrogen molecule or hydrogen uh, molecule which reacts on the surface and then every hydrogen sort of ties up, ties up the dangling bonds. And you realize it needed one, it had one dangling bond. Hydrogen has one electron, one proton. And it's a small atom, so it can just get through anything. And therefore they will come down and essentially passive it, all those bonds. And now all the silicons are satisfied, electrons can grow, go un unimpeded from source to drain without being sort of trapped by the dangling bond of, of silicon. Now this process is very important, but bef even before that, so for, uh, first of all, this will reduce it to a tremendous amount, but even before you bring in silane, what is done at many times is that this processing of silicon dioxide, the growth of silicon dioxide, generally has to be done at a very high temperature. The temperature you see here in degrees centigrade is 1100 or 1200 degrees C. And that will give you, look at the plot, it gives you about 2 times 10 to the 11. Here you have not yet done this hydrogen or forming gas anneal or the passivation, not yet but you still have 10 to the power about uh, 2 times 10 to the power 11 even when you anneal it at 1200 degrees C. And it's very important that you keep the anneal temperature very high uh, because if your anneal temperature is low, then the number of defects that you have or dangling bonds that you have in the surface can be a very large number. One thing I want to point out that this is 111 surface. That's where the experimental data is reported from. But if it is on 100 surface, it will be one third less. And this is something you should understand because this is something people often ask you in various interviews and other things that why is silicon 
is on 100 surface, although in many cases 111 surface might have better mobility, right? It could have better mobility. The reason is that when you cut in terms of 100 surface, the number of bonds you have per centimeter squared is actually less. And that therefore, the number of dangling bonds are less. And as a result, you have less trap on 100 surface. And therefore, people prefer to do it uh, in 100 surface. But here, it's a 111 surface, and you have that certain number. The interesting thing is that if you anneal it at a particular temperature, and then anneal simply means heating it up. Just put it in a chamber, a piece of silicon, and raise the temperature of the furnace. Like in a microwave, you put something in, raise the temperature. So raise the temperature. And if you do that, then essentially the number of defects uh, will go down. Now, these are essentially broken silicon bonds, which are about to react with oxygen that was coming down, but didn't have a chance to. So high temperature helps in the reaction process. Now, the best one is, of course, if you always anneal it in the ambient nitrogen or hydrogen uh, environment rather than pure dry O2. So in that case, you can see you can have a flat region even at lower temperature, let's say 800 or 900 degrees C, because it ties up all the bonds on the, on the surface. Now, once you have done it, once you have done it, then you can see the defect density might go from 10 to the power 12. You can see the blue curve, which is add oxidized. And do you see between these two? So this is saying that in the mid-gap region, remember the mid-gap regions are the ones that are most interesting. We're talking about traps, right? Do you remember Shockley Reed Hall? that if you have a lot of traps close to uh, the conduction and valence band, doesn't matter. The ones that are most effective for shockley reed hall recombination or surface recombination are the ones that are in the middle, mid-gap region. And you can see here that number is on the order of 10 to the power 12 if you do not do any forming gas anneal or do not tie it up with hydrogen. But as soon as you do so, you can see that the number reduces to 10 to the power 10. And this is this today is what you need in order for an operating good MOSFET that you can buy for your Pentium and other processes. Numbers on the order of 10 to the power 10 number of states per centimeter squared. Now, when this defects goes from 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power 10, after this hydrogen passivation, now, this defects correspondingly, the signature of it, that you have been able to reduce the number of defects, is also reflected in the CV characteristics. You can see here on the bottom right-hand side that I have plotted the capacitance as a function of gate voltage. Now, do you see that this capacitance is flipped? Because the, all the capacitances that we had been looking into, accumulation was on the negative gate voltage. because the substrate was p-type. Now, this particular experiment, I have taken it from the book, or particular diagram, I have taken it from the book. In that case, the substrate is n-type. If it is n-type, then you realize that all the voltage polarity required to see accumulation, depletion, and inversion, those will all get the other, other way around. And you can see that before, you have a strange CV curve that goes from it has the accumulation on the right hand side to a particular value. Do you notice that C divided by C naught is equal to one because in accumulation, the charge is just sitting next to the oxide. So that's why you have it one. And then as you go through this uh, threshold uh, flat band region and gradually go to the accumulation region, I'm sorry, the inversion region, then you can see that on the other side, starting from minus 10 volt, this is essentially flat and at a lower value of capacitance. What frequency is this? This is at relatively high frequency, right? Because this is not a high, otherwise it would have gone back. And this is a capacitor structure. How do you know? Because in transistor, you would have never seen that the flat region, well, which is at high frequency, because in transistor high frequency, even at high frequency, it goes back to one, right? Threshold voltage, minus 10 volts here. Do you see that? That's why it becomes flat. All right. Now, this blue curve corresponds to that very high defect density, 10 to the power 12, let's say. 
what happens that after you anneal, the effectiveness is reflected by the sharpened, by much sharpened um, the rate, rate uh, CV characteristics. And you can see it remains flat for more regions. The flat band is close to one and the threshold voltage has gone down significantly. Do you see that? It's my about minus two, minus three volt. And this has happened because all the interface traps that were trapping charges before, you know, this QF and QIT that was the interface charge, those have been taken out. Therefore, your threshold voltage has gone back. Now, this is very important that you understand the physics of this stretch out. This is called this blue curve. It sort of looks like you have stretched the red curve out. So that's why it's called a stretched out CV. It gives you a lot of information about the status of the surface. Remember, surface is everything. In MOSFET, surface is everything. And so that gives you a status. So we want to understand uh, why this blue curve looks like this. Why is it stretched out like this? So that is what I want to explain to you. Now, this is very important to understand that just like uh, donors is an atom, donor is an atom, let's say, which gives away electron, right? Close to the conduction band gives away electron. Every trap have very similar characteristics. But in this particular case, these donor levels, the surface levels, of course, they are spread throughout. Look at the left-hand side plot. I have plot the conduction and valence band, and I have uh, plotted the, the just close to the interface between silicon dioxide and silicon. Now, the blue and the red, these are actually the same surface states. Now, the dotted line is a Fermi level. Now, this is, let's assume that these levels are donor-like. These are not donors. These are donor-like. What it means is that, you know, when your donor level is below the Fermi level, then the donor is full, right? Because it hasn't given away its electron. When a donor doesn't give away its electron, then it has as many protons as the number of electrons. Therefore, because it hasn't given away anything. Therefore, anything below that dotted line, Fermi level, is charge zero. It has not given away its electrons, it's full donor levels, therefore it's charge zero. What about the ones above, which are the red dumbbell-shaped thing? What, what about them? Those are above Fermi level. In above Fermi level, Typically, these are, Fermi function is zero. Therefore, they are empty. And if the donors are empty, then these are positively charged. Okay. Look at the, so if it, that, that happens if it is donor-like, if. On the other hand, look at the middle panel. Let's assume now that these are not donor-like. These are acceptor-like. Now, in this case, what does an acceptor do? Again, you see in the middle panel, the dotted line being the Fermi level, below, sorry, the, uh, the levels above, the blue lines, small blue, blue, blue lines, in those cases, those are empty, right? Above Fermi level, they are empty. If they are empty, that means they have not caught any, any more electrons. So in that case, what will happen? They, those will be zero charge because an acceptor, until it catches an electron, right? It is not, it's charge neutral. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if it is below, then it's full. It fulls means, remember, it has one extra place for one extra electron in the outer shell, right? That's what the acceptor is, like boron is an acceptor. So, it catches one electron. It's full. As a result, everything that is below for acceptors is negative, right? It takes a minute to think through this, but you get the idea. Now, what happens that many times these levels, depending on how, how the hydrogen bonds are oriented in different direction, may either behave like a donor level or an acceptor level. So in general, what I have seen on the right hand side, that generally you have it will have a combination. Now, do you realize the dumbbell shaped blue ones, these will be positively charged, right? I'm sorry, those would be neutral. Neutral because below Fermi level donor like, and the dumbbell shaped red ones, those will be positive. And similarly, what will happen to the uh, ones uh, short uh, red segments on the right? 
these would be below the Fermi level that that means those will be negatively charged because these are acceptors when they have an electron extra electron then they are negatively charged and so from here depending on the Fermi level you can see I can tune how many positive and negative charges I have on the surface right and that will give me different amount of threshold voltage shift so that's what I'm after so let's see what happens now follow with me carefully because this is something the professors like very much and uh, let's see whether I can explain to you what type of substrate I have this is a n type substrate so therefore you can see my CV characteristics is facing to the other side than then what I typically drive uh, typically draw now let me assume that these are donor like all donor like traps now I have bent the band I have applied a positive bias so now the n substrate is in accumulation because it has brought closer to it all the electrons majority carrier now the level the all the de defect levels are below the Fermi level they are all full if they are all full what is the total amount of charge zero donor levels all full below the Fermi level zero charge if it is zero charge then of course I have whatever my classical standard CV characteristics is no problem if it stayed zero throughout the voltage swings then I would have this ideal red uh, CV characteristics however however what happens that as you go up by the way on the on the top side I have written alpha VG multiplied by C ox Q ox because this amount of charge depending on the bias will be changing and so alpha the fraction of the total a uh, number of defects that contributes to the charge that will be changing depending on the bias there. Now let's say I'm beginning to go the other way beginning to deplete right so I have to apply a negative bias because it's n substrate now am as I am beginning to deplete a fraction of the charges fraction of the defects have moved up the Fermi level do you see that therefore now I have some charge contribution which will change my threshold voltage as a result if this fraction for example if it remained the same throughout for all voltages then I would have a fixed shift in the threshold voltage associated with this amount of charge so I would have this blue curve if this was constant I'm not saying it's constant everywhere but if had it been constant this amount of charge then I would have a fixed shift in the threshold voltage and you can see the blue curve has shifted a little bit more if I now try to invert it invert the substrate all the defects are up above the Fermi level everybody is positive huge change in the threshold voltage so I will have the final curve over there now it's supposed to be the first curve was supposed to be magenta and the last one is red hopefully you can see that now of course this is going through this phase is as a function of voltage so as if the threshold voltage keeps changing as you keep pulling the bias as if the threshold voltage keeps changing so the real curve you'll be seeing is not this separate three curves of course what you will be seeing is that there will be a transition of this curve among this curve from one to another now do you see you have stretched things out now I have just shown you three discrete points of course it will be a continuum of points and you can see therefore the green will become a continuously stressed out CV characteristics you see that right okay so that is for the donor states on this side on the uh, accumulation I'm sorry the depletion and the inversion side but if you have acceptor states that will give you stretch out on the accumulation side this is how now if it is acceptor like then what happens then if you are on the starting from now for this CV characteristics I'm starting from the very right very right because look at the uh, band diagram I've applied a large negative bias close to inversion right it's close to inversion now this is acceptor like all the states are above Fermi level as a result they are all empty and if they are all empty empty means acceptor means it has not accepted any more electrons it needs electrons therefore the charge is zero so that the uh, CV characteristics is ideal CV characteristics no problem now as you are going the other way 
because now you are sort of going from the accumulation, trying to come the other, starting from inversion, going to the other way of accumulation. Then as you move down, then of course you have a bunch of ex, uh, acceptor states below the Fermi level. Now these are negatively charged because they just accepted an additional electron. Remember, when boron catches an additional electron, that is when it becomes Na minus. So therefore, I will have a some negative charge. And when I have negative charge, you know, correspondingly the threshold voltage, if you put the values in, it will move to the positive side. So now this is will be your threshold voltage. You see that? And then if you really try to accumulate it, go to the other way, everything is below Fermi level, all acceptor states full negative impact of full negative. The curve has completely shifted to the right. Again, because of these charges, you will have this transition going, because this is continuous process, right? So due, due to acceptor states, therefore, you have a corresponding stretch out here. And so when you pull them together, then you see that you have a continuous, uh, if you have a combination of both present, donors and acceptor present, then you will have this stretch out that will go continuously. Now there is a, I show a discontinuity over there that there will not be any discontinuity because you will sum them. You will sum them, so therefore the effect will sum up. I have shown them individually, therefore there, there is a discontinuity over there. And that's what your before, uh, before annealing uh, CV characteristics is. Now I will tell you all about hydrogen passivation and other things, two lectures down. But for the time being, this is very important to understand that anytime if you see a stretch out, you know you're, you have to improve your surface. And then you go and try out various strategies to improve your surface. You know, this is, has got nothing to do with silicon per se. It could be gallium arsenide. If you have donor and acceptor like surface states, you will have the same problem. It could be graphene or it could be anything. And this stretch out simply reflects the fact that there is a voltage dependent charging of the surface states and somehow you have to fix it because otherwise your transistor isn't working. And so the strategy will be different. Here hydrogen passivation works, other places there are other things that people have done. So to conclude this lecture, so we are talking about non-ideal threshold characteristics and obviously, obviously it's a very important thing for MOSFET design. Um, and this uh, Non-ideality arises from wide variety of sources. Your choice of substrate and the gate, uh, gate metal, aluminum, germanium, uh, copper, silicon. This combination dictates what your uh, work function is going to be. And in many cases, it's a good thing. I'll show you later. And trap charges. What are these? What are these trap charges? These are essentially charges that could be sodium moves back and forth. This day it doesn't happen because of course you are not allowed to get into that room anyway. These are robots will essentially say thank you, you can stay outside, they will do all the handling and they don't have sodium chloride in their hands. So therefore you don't have that problem, but there are other problems. But the interface states a very fundamental problem. Uh, then these uh, almost there is not too many good ways to handle it. Hydrogen passivation is one, one very effective. And these are all discovered in 1960s, by the way. And that made the first Intel transistor possible, processor possible in 19, early 1970s. All in Fairchild, as I said before. And uh, now there are other non-ideal effects due to transistor degradation. And I will show you in that two class down how, how this works.